G'day everyone, welcome back. This week's episode is called Men of Our Time, Matt Tomlinson. I sat down with Matt to dig into his story and ultimately why he chose to represent the seat of right in the upcoming election and why he chose politics. What was the story behind that? Why did he decide to do that? And I wanted to give the people of his electorate and our awesome coders a chance to get to know Matt because to have someone willing to stand up and represent their people is such a commendable thing to do. So much respect for myself and I know all the other boys behind the podcast for him to do that. And I thought it was a good chance for him to sit down and tell his story. Now this is Matt's first long form interview. And when everyone sits down for their first one-on-one podcast, there's a bit of nerves there. However, I think he did a really awesome job and I think he got his points across very well. The fact that he was willing to come on and the things that he's willing to do at the moment... He's putting himself out of his comfort zone. However, that's where we learn, guys. It's a lot of the stuff we've already talked about here on the podcast before. And again, it's his first long-form conversation. So it takes a lot of courage to step up and do the interview. However, to do all the things that he's doing. And the people of right, I believe, would be privileged to have him represent them. Because it, it is about the people for him. That's his community. That's where he grew up. And we'll find out all about that in the story. Matt chose Bathe in the Sun for the intro song. So, as always, thank you very much to Rowdy for that. And as always, thanks to Jono for the awesome intro. I decided to throw Waiting for the World to Change on the end because I think it's a little bit appropriate because times are a-changing. However, in Australia, we do need a change. We do need a political change. And Matt's willing to step up and try and make that change. So, welcome in with open arms, everyone. Enjoy the new equipment. The quality stepped up tenfold. So many cool things going on behind the scenes. Onwards, upwards, ever forwards. Keep hustling, guys. Look after yourselves, and we'll talk soon. Cheers. Today, I sat in a field of paper daisies. The gentle breeze made the world wave to me. The day has come with a gold ring wrapped around it.
G'day everyone, welcome back. This one is very special for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, you'll notice the audio quality is a hell of a lot better because we're coming to you on the brand new mics. Secondly, and more importantly, we've got Matt Tomlinson joining us tonight. How are you, mate? Triff, good to be here, mate. Thank you for having me. Thank you for doing this, man. Uh, listeners would have met Matt before. He was part of uh, episode 50. We went out to his place and sat around the fire and had a few drinks and told some stories and explored some stuff, didn't we, mate? It was an awesome experience. I had a great night out there. And then also he was part of the uh, Magnificent Seven, that epic seven-person podcast that I still can't believe was as good as it was, you know? That that works so well. How we could pull seven blokes to, uh, seven blokes together who most hadn't met before mm. and make a tangible, intelligent conversation was it was unreal. Oh, I think there's the respect everyone showed each other and, and some of the topics we dug into yeah. around a poker table, you yeah. know, like fear and love and all that sort of stuff. Like yeah. it, it was very interesting. Laying it out there. Absolutely. So for those that haven't listened to the Magnificent Seven or Episode 50, they're both good ones, aren't yeah, they, mate? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, really good. Highly recommend that. However, tonight we are digging into Matt's story. So Matt's decided to step up and represent his people in the upcoming election. And I wanted to use the platform that we've got to let his people know and my people know what you're about, mate. So tell us about Matt Tomlinson, man. Where did you grow up? So I was born in um, born in Bow Desert. Yep. Um, back in 1986, so I'm pretty pretty young by a lot of people's standards to be considering politics. But um, it's it's one of those things. I thought it the, the way Australia is going, it's, it was now or never. Australia might not be here in five or ten years' time if it keeps going the way it is, and it's it's about time um, some p- real people stepped up and and worked on getting some change happening. I couldn't agree more, mate. I couldn't agree more. So you grew, so you're a Queensland boy through and through. Grew Absolutely. up in Bow Desert, and obviously primary school, high school, nothing much to report there. Or so primary school um, went to a great little school called Hillview. Um, I think we averaged about twenty eight kids most years. Two teachers. It was fantastic. You know, the quality of education we could get was outstanding. It set me up for life. Oh, well, there's a lot of engagement there with that many students and that many teachers. You know, yeah. I think that's one of the issues with public schools at the moment is that too many kids and not enough students, and that's a whole different story. However, we can, yep. yeah. So Hillview, that that'd be, that would have been very cool, man. You know it, what I mean? It was a, yeah, great location. I, I, I still live, I basically live straight over the hill from it now. Yeah, it, it's a great, it's a great spot. It's a great community and within 10 minutes of Leamington National Park, which is, you know, one of the five best national parks in Australia. I think it's number one, but it's in the, definitely in the top five. You are a little biased, though, mate. A little biased there. <laughs> so you did primary school there. Where'd you do high school? And then um, from high school, we jumped up to um, Bow Desert State High School. Mm-hmm. And that went from, yeah, as I said, averaging 28 kids to over 1,500. And that was a, that was an eye-opener. That would have been a bit of a change for you, mate. I mean, obviously, very. Yeah, how did how did old young Matt cope with that back in the day? Um, he did he did the best he could. He's pretty good student generally. Generally, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was a it was just a big learning curve. You're going from um, you know being top dog at a at a small school to the really small fry in a big school was. It was a big change. Big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a big pond. That's exactly right. Well, there's a bit of uh, growing, I suppose, at that time as well. You know, you you do grow a lot. You're coming into being a man, in quotes, you know, not that we probably do that to a 25, however. Anything to note in high school? I suppose, is politics something you've already been always interested in? Did did the seed get planted early on or is it? Yeah, I think think it started primarily when we had a um, a teacher once – and this is going back to the start of um, it. It all sort of started around the nine eleven, and we had a teacher um, who was wanting to put up anti-war posters in our room for one of the classes. And I stood up and said, uh-uh, "That's not right. We're not here to be, you know, led led one way or another. We're here for an education which is unbiased, not leaning left, not leaning right. Yeah, it's make your own decisions. Yeah. yeah. How old were you when you did that? So that was." Um, that would have been early 2002, so 16. 16? Yeah, 15, 16. Well, suppose you're starting to get your ideologies together, aren't you? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, you know, starting to starting to learn which way you start um, looking in life. I mean, growing up, I was 
I've always been quite conservative. Mm. Um, you know, when I was a little fellow, I used to get upset when people cut down a tree and or if, you know people wanted to shoot kangaroos. I, I couldn't understand it. Couldn't understand why, yeah. But as I've grown older, I've understand the reasons why these things happen. Mm, mm, absolutely, absolutely. So you went through to year 12? or Went through to year 12. Yeah. Um, year 12, I was school captain at high school. Yeah, right. Okay. So you, you did flourish eventually in, a, in that sort of environment. Yeah, you got to turn it around, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. And what was your uh, chosen sport or field? Obviously, being school captain, you would have had to res- represent a couple of things. Um, I was... I've always loved sports. I was never terribly good at many of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about that. It's about and, getting out there and, and having a good time. And Bowie, but as it's um, you know historically been a strong rugby league town, and I've never played rugby league. Um, well, you're a bit of a string bean, mate. For those, yeah, that, I was a bit, uh, a bit too light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get snapped. <laughs> I'm definitely not fast enough. Yeah, right. So right. long, long distance and endurance is more of my thing. So a bit of cross country racing. That's cross country stuff. was yeah, it was my strong suit. Yeah, right. And I see swimming. you up, swimming. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. I see you've been doing a bit of running you know, on Strava and that as well to keep yourself going for the campaign as well, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, mate. Well, I'm also um, aiming for a 100K ultra marathon at the end of the year. You just finished one, didn't you? What did you just do? That, was only, that was only half marathon. Half marathon. So what's that? 13? Um, no, it was 21, 22Ks. 21, 22Ks. Yeah. The well ul- done, man. The ultra I'm heading for is 100K, so it's you've got a long way to go yet. And how did you pull up after the 21? Yeah, pull up, um, pull up pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, had a bit of a big learning curve with... You know, how to really start taking things a bit more seriously with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, um, no, I was quite happy with how I recovered. That's awesome, man. And you finished, obviously, no worries. No, got, got it finished. <clears throat> not not as quick as I'd, I'd hoped to, but, um, you know, you, you can't prepare for everything. We go faster next time, mate. Absolutely. Yeah. I, the main idea was just to finish it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm personally aiming for a four-hour enduro on a mountain bike next year, mm. and my aim is just to start it and finish yep. it yep. and we'll go from there yeah that's exactly right you know I'm not, you, not yeah you're, you're your only, only competitor you're absolutely not, yeah absolutely absolutely so where did you go from high school mate what's because uh, obviously I know you're, you're helping to look after a big property at, at Bow Desert Way now mm-hmm. uh, so where how did we end up there so I left high school and um, I didn't go to schoolies I got a job straight away yeah and um, yeah, talk to me man yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was selling um, selling white goods Okay. So um, like I, a, I did that for about six months. And, good guys or something like that? Or? Um, it was a buy ride electrical. Buy ride electrical. They don't oh. exist anymore, do they? Uh, there's a few around, just not how they... Yeah, Used not the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I did that for six months and that inside work really wasn't for me. Um, I mean, I did pretty well with the sales part, but um, it, wasn't, it wasn't my passion. No, no. So where did we go from buy ride electrical? So from buy ride, I left there and... Um, Worked for a local thoroughbred stud as a um, an assistant um, um, horse breaker. So this is this is feeding into your passions, mate. Because I know you going, love your yeah, horses. Yeah, this I is going back horses. to yeah. yeah. So yeah, grew up, grew up on you know riding horses. I used to as one of my afternoon chores, I'd jump on the horse and ride across to the dairy next door, about two k up the road. Yep. And um, grab a few liters of milk and and come back again. Yeah, right. Back in the days when you could actually just. Go to your neighbouring dairy and yeah, get a get a get, get a pint of milk, get yeah. some fresh milk, pay yeah. f- pay a few bucks for it, come back, and then come home. Yeah, right. Can't do that now with all these regulations. Yeah, well, I used to. Uh, I remember in Darwin, I was I think Paul's iced coffee, and um, they make a chocolate milk and a nice coffee. It's delicious. Like, yeah, but they make it up there, and uh, they used to leave it out for the homeless once upon a time, and you know they used to love that, mm. and they can't do that anymore. Yeah, and that's like. Yeah, that's I don't understand that. It's, you know it's just I mean? crazy. Yeah. So obviously you had a horse stud, mate. Did you hang? How long did you hang around there for? Yeah, I was there for eleven months, and I um, had a couple of really bad injuries in pretty close succession. Um, horse riding, or yeah, yeah. Um, had one horse try and kill me with his two front feet. Nice. Um, yeah. Lucky not to break any ribs or. I like fully stomped you. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, went to town, and then um, I recovered from that, and then. Got back on another horse and it was only a few days back into riding and this one um, flipped over on top of me and I broke my tailbone. Ooh, that hurts, man. Yeah. That hurts a yeah, lot. It wasn't pleasant. And you, there's nothing, the thing about the tailbone is there's, there's nothing you can do. Like yeah. you sit or you move, it's... Yeah, it's not there. A lot they it can, lets you know. And there's not a lot they can do for you no. either with that. 
Well, I didn't even go to the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> it, it just wasn't what I did. I just went home and recovered, and once I was able to ride again, I did. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, it was no, no sitting down on concrete for a long time. Even to this day, I can't sit down on the ground for too long. Yeah, right. Um, well, like, the trauma is there, isn't it? You it's know there, I mean? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Interesting and painful. I remember I did mine... I did mine uh, impressing a girl, actually, which, you know, I was uh, at, a, at a beach somewhere and um, we'd forgotten the bags. So we were already down the beach. I thought I'd take a shortcut down the grassy thing through the rocks and bang. full of hands and uh, slipped on the grass and bang. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, so easy to happen. Not pleasant, man. No, no, no. Not fun. Don't recommend it for anyone. No, no. So you recovered from that and where did we go from there? So from there, um, well, I couldn't ride for... Um, about three or four months so I ended up going down to Victoria um, with my granddad mm -hmm. he, he was going down there for a bit and um, and yes yeah, so I went down and visited him and then um, come back and I was working at a local stock feeds and again being back indoors you know it was just a job but mm -hmm. wasn't where I wanted to be and then um, I saw a, a notice on the on the um, notice board looking for a polo groom Okay, yeah, and yeah. I thought, yeah. Well, I've never seen polo. I'd better go and have a look at this. Yeah. So I went out to Croban and and um, watched some polo out there. And w within the first chakra, I was hooked. I was like, I need to be a part of this. Yeah, right. Do you, do you still play a bit of polo, do you? Uh, polo not? cross. Polo cross. Yeah, yeah, I haven't the last couple of seasons, but I yeah, did play three seasons. Yeah, right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, see, I haven't been around horses too much. I've ridden a few. Uh, I, I suppose, I'll be honest and say I'm one of those blokes that I, I'll take a motorbike, mate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Some days I feel the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, they're, I think they're, they're, there's something about them. They're too smart for me. You know what I mean? Like they, I've looked after a couple. Like you, I used to feed a couple when I first came to Brisbane back in '06, and you know I rode one of those um, a little bit. However, yeah, love them. You know what I mean? Yeah. However, it's not. My, in my upbringing, upbringing, I didn't, I wasn't a random mate. So yeah, it's not yeah. like when it's not part of your mm. culture or part of your structure, it's not something you really think about. Yeah. I can, I can respect that they're amazing, beautiful animals, mm. and the guys that the, some of the things I've seen people do on horses is it's oh, next level, man. Yeah. So what, what's polo cross? So polo cross is a, um, it's an Australian sport. It's um, instead of having four or six horses like you would in polo, you only have one horse. Okay. Um, you've got a, um, and instead of having a team of four, you've got a team of six, which you split into half. So you've got um, three people on in playing in one chucker, mm -hmm. and then a chuck is like a quarter. Yep. And then you'll have a break. You'll come off, and then your other half of your team will go on for the next chucker. Oh, okay. So, you, so keep so everyone a bit fresh. And give your horse a bit of a break. That, yeah, that's the main right. aim of the game. Okay, well, that's good, man. And I it's like about that stuff. It's, and it's about endurance then. So making sure your horses are super fit. And and how long's a chucker? How long's that? Um, seven minutes. Okay, so it's not very long at all. So yeah, you, so you place one seven minute, go off, have a seven minute break, and then go back on again. Yeah. So by the end of the weekend. Um, you, you'll generally play four games. Okay. So you've, you've, you know, your horse has been playing flat out for nearly an hour's worth yeah, by the right. end of a weekend. And so. it's intense too. You, you're turning them and you're, it, you're giving them hell. A lot of people call it rugby on horseback. Yeah, I've seen it, man. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Like yep. I'd, I'd actually like to go and watch a game. I'd... Mate, the, the, the um, Polo Cross World Cup's coming up at the, um, after Easter up in Warwick and it's going to be just... Off the wall. Yeah, off the off the scales yeah right unreal, unreal. Australia's got a lot of um, um, we've got a point to prove we got beaten by the South Africans here last year yeah uh, right two, two years ago yeah so it's it's definitely going to be a grudge match and it's an Aussie sport it's an Australian sport that's grown internationally okay yeah. so we'll have um, New so Zealand gonna, we've got to give it to them mate I mean let's oh, be mate, honest absolutely we'll be on Australian <laughs> not to exactly and they, those boys go pretty hard like, oh, I'm I'm just a trotter compared to what those guys do. Oh, yeah. Well, the South African boys are good boys too, you know what I mean? Like, I've worked with a few of those over the years. But yeah. They don't take no prisoners either. No, there's no boys. love lost between, no, the, no, between no. the two nations. No, definitely not. Definitely so. not. Yeah, right. That's very cool, man. So, you, so basically, your job as a polo groom is looking after horses in between breaks or what What was you doing the, there? The, the, whole, the whole time. So, um, it was a six-day-a-week job, um, looking after the horses um, through the week, getting them fit, feeding them make sure they're all right. And then on the weekends, you'd um, start out by grooming for the games. Yep. So you'd just be 
you know, putting all the saddles on, bridles, bandages, tails. Yeah, and they look, make them look pretty smicko yeah, too. Oh, they look they, unreal. They plait the hair and they do all that sort of stuff. I've seen those polo horses. They look unbelievable. Yeah, they look really good. Yeah. So then they go out and play and, the, you know, the horse will play their one chucker or some of them only play half a chucker. Yeah. They come back and then that's their day done. Yeah, right. And so we switch out horses sort of thing. So and like then you this. just have the next horse ready to go. Yeah, right. So, so they, they, these teams have got stables of horses that they just rotate through sort of Yeah, thing. so the guys that I was working for, they were um, generally high goal players. And each of them would have 20 horses in a string. Wow. So they could choose their six or eight best horses they wanted to play. For the, what? And is it is it like, uh, I suppose the only analogy that I can use from my own mind is that, you know, when uh, I, used to, I played AFL, like, I grew up <laughs> in Victoria, so you'd use different studs for your boots, you know what I mean? Different length studs, but I suppose you'd analyse the course of the team and you'd do, use different horses for different... Different horses, that's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, yeah, it, it was very tactical like, in that sense. Yeah, right. Mm. I mean, some serious coin, man, 20 horses. Yeah, no, it wasn't cheap. Yeah, Lucky right. I didn't have to pay it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a very interesting job, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's inter- I love uh, finding out about things that I don't, know about you know what i mean like i've never been to a polo game you know what i mean i've seen it on tv all that sort of stuff yeah and i suppose there would have to be someone that looks after those horses Mm. 24 7 making sure they're primo top tip top ready to go absolutely i mean a lot of a lot of people think it's just a sport for the royals yeah but in australia most of the guys are you know just regular blokes yeah right just love their horses love their horses yeah yeah and look after them. You must have to look after them real well. Because got, you, oh, they're on they're on show every weekend, so they've got to be looking pretty good. Yeah, and tip top, best food, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. If if your horses aren't performing, they're not. If not doing the right thing, then you don't get to play the next weekend because no one will hire you to come and play for them. Yeah, right, mm. right, right. So how long were you a polo groomer for? Um, so I did, was involved with polo for um, um, about about four seasons, four or five seasons. Yeah, right. Um, went to go. Over most of Australia doing it. Yeah, that'd around. be cool. That'd so, be cool. So when we had the um, equine influenza outbreak, there was yes. no, yes, yep. yeah, there was no that. horse moving up and down the east coast of Australia. So I actually went across to Western Australia and went um, groomed and played over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what you were hired to go over there and look after the horses over there? Or you yeah, by- yeah, going over there and I um, got hired to go over there and look after horses, and then got lucky enough to play a few games as well. Oh, really? Yeah. So What's it like to? It must be a lot of adrenaline, like having that massive animal under you, all that sort of stuff. Like it's, uh, yeah. I, I'd rather do that than jump out of a plane. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's it, that's my rush. Yeah, that's um, awesome, mate. And and I'm a bit of a. Um, in the sense that I'm a control freak. I'd rather be driving than being the, the passenger. But with the horses, I'm happy to be the passenger. I, I just... Because realistically, I, I are, are, you, uh, are you driving the horse or is the horse driving you? It's teamwork. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it knows what to do and you're giving it input to help it along its way. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, some of the best polo horses and polo cross horses, you, you're just a passenger. They, they they know where the ball is. All you have to do is worry about picking the ball up or hitting the ball. They know where it is. They know where it is. They, they do, they're following the ball They themselves. do the rest for you. Yeah, yeah, right. They love it. Yeah, right. I yeah. suppose it's a game for them too. Yeah, absolutely. I think, because as I say, I looked after a couple of horses for a little while, about a year or so, you know, all the feeding them and all that sort of stuff. Yep. And I got to know those two horses and they are an unbelievably intelligent animal. Mm. You know, absolutely. You know, they are next yep. level. They're definitely sentient. You yep. know what I mean? I, I, I've got no doubt about that whatsoever. And and if a horse doesn't want to do it... It won't do it. it it's not going to do it. You're not going to get the best out of it. No. Um, so you've got, to make, you've got to look after it and excite it and make it want to do it. Y- yeah, you've got to, you know, prim- help um, excite the horse. Yeah. Make it fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, they do get sour pretty quick if you just do the same boring things all the time. Oh, they're moody. That's what I noticed looking oh, after yeah. these other two horses. If I didn't walk them for a couple of days or, you know what I mean, didn't yep. change, you know, like they, yeah. they know. Yeah. They? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they're a, they're a funny animal and I, I think that's why I'm just so drawn to them. I just, I connect with them. Yeah, and people do, man. You know what I mean? And you've got you've to go with what you're connected to. Yeah. So that would have been a hell of an experience. I mean, you must have some stories from going around the country for five years grooming horses. Is there any 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 golden ones you want to share with the guys? Or um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> What's what happens on tour stays on tour. Fair enough, mate. I understand. Uh, so where'd we go from polo cross? So from polo um, went travelling overseas. Um, where'd you go? I uh, went to Germany and then to Canada. 
just uh, backpacking, just doing your own thing, or over there specifically? Yeah, I met a um, met a girl in WA, yep. German girl, and um, yeah, decided to quit the polo because if the GFC had happened by then, then no one everyone had any money. Pulled, everyone pulled out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I could, you, yeah. you know, the polo scene was dying for the time, so I thought, well, let's go travelling. Yeah, right. And then... um, I was actually invited to go play in England. Okay. Um, but I decided to chase the girl instead. These things happen, mate. These it things happens. happen. And what was um, what was that like, man? And there's what was I mean, some of the, I'd love to go to Germany. Very interesting place. I loved it. Yeah. I thought it was a fantastic place. Um, yeah. Very respectful people. Yeah. Um, very regimented. Uh-huh. Um, I, I kind of like that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they make the you know big name it, mate. If it's got made in Germany on it, it's, it's awesome. quality. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know absolutely. what I mean. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, who who doesn't want a, a nice BMW sitting in their garage? You know what I mean. That's exactly right. And, yeah. and the and the BMW in Germany is just a like a Commodore here. Yeah, it's just a taxi. Yeah, yeah exactly. Man. <laughs> it's nothing yeah. nothing special. No, no, no. So where else did you go in? So Germany? Did you do the all around Europe, or did you mainly stay focused around? Uh, I, did, I didn't actually do that much traveling around Germany. I stayed around um, just a couple of local areas. Um, like I went up to Hamburg and Frankfurt, and you know a couple of those big places. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I didn't do too much. I'd like to go back and actually see more around Europe. There's a lot more places I'd like to see. And so, how long were you traveling around? So I did nearly twelve months all up of traveling. Yeah. So between Germany and Canada. Yeah. And then we went down the um, east coast of the United States as well from Canada. Oh wow! What's Canada like? I mean, Loved it. All the Canadians I've ever met have been top, top blokes and top chicks. You know what They're I mean? They're basically Australians with a funny accent. Yeah, that's what I reckon too. <laughs> that's what I reckon too. Yeah, you know what I mean? There's a a bloke called Jeff, he was my rig manager in PNG. You know, if he rang me and said, I've got a job for you, mate, I'd be hard pressed not to just go, no worries, yeah, mate. Yep, you know what I mean? Like, yep. just because, yeah. Yeah, good people. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, uh, yep. what, what was the highlight of Canada? Uh, the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, I. I, I it's it's yeah. the one place, like, I, I love Australia to death and I don't want to die anywhere else, but if I could die anywhere else, it would be in the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, right. It's yeah, just, yeah, that's, yeah. it's God's own country. Yeah, so he's, so how long do you spend traveling around Canada? Um, so most of the time in Canada, I actually worked and stayed around Vancouver. What bar work or? No, it was actually uh, like mowing lawns. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, <it's> a, <laughs> so was, the Aussie bloke come around and uh, cut your grass, mate. Eh? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. So there's a whole crew. Um, there's oh, there would have been thirty or forty blokes that worked for this company. Yeah, and most of them are Australians. Yeah, right. We, we know how to mow grass. Yeah, absolutely. We can take care of the grass, mate. Yeah. So yeah, right. It was a funny process. We'd come in um, just after winter had broken and. We'd actually um, have this special machine that had cut the moss out of the ground. Oh, okay. Because the, the moss, moss had grown. Uh, under the under, ice. Yeah, under yeah, the snow right. and ice. Yeah. So you cut that out of the ground, throw your seed out, grass will pop up, you come back and mow it. And you do that for spring and summer. And then... Um, winter comes winter and kills comes it all. Winter comes and kills it all and you start again. <laughs> wow. So I only did um, a spring and start of summer. Yeah. Um, or from the end of winter through the start of summer. Yeah, right. And um, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was good. Good physical work. Got mm. to drive around Vancouver and see a bit. Met some great people. Yeah, right. So were you, was you, were you still with your, your friend at this stage? Or yeah, you... yeah, still with her at that stage. Yeah. And I um, was travelling around with her. Yeah. And then um, saved up enough money to, to actually go travelling around Canada a bit. Mm-hmm. So we jumped on a, um, a greyhound and... Um, did what, the site sort of thing? Yeah, just went around to as many places as you, we could. Did you do Niagara? Went to Niagara. What's that like? I mean, you see a thousand million pictures of it, but I imagine it's bloody impressive. It's very impressive. Yeah. Um, and I suppose we are Australian, so we've got a lot of waterfalls, so it'd have to take something pretty impressive to yeah. impress Just us. the sheer volume of water that mm. continuously flows over. Mm. It's unreal. Unbelievable. Yeah. What, what else What else was that? So Rockies, Niagara, what else? Uh, I went up, went up into the Yukon, uh-huh. up in the north near Alaska. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's that, something else, man. Oh, that was beautiful country. That was yeah, unreal as well. Yeah, right. A um, little town up there called Dawson City, and it, it's like straight out of a western. It's you know timber sidewalks, dirt roads, the whole deal. Um, yeah, little bars with um, women with the the Victorian era era skirts and yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so they make it, it's a whole tourist destination. Oh, it's like a tourist uh, destination. Yeah. So yeah, it, right. it was born during the gold rush up there. Yes. And then it's just they're like, hey, gold rush is over. How can we make money? Let's keep it all happening. Yeah, right. Sovereign Hill and Ballarat's very similar to that. Yeah, whole... yeah. Sovereign Hills. Yeah. yeah, very similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I love Sovereign Hill, man. I actually used because uh, I grew up in Ballarat, and in, as in primary school, we uh, went there as a class, and I actually spent time there as like 
the tourists would come and watch us in yeah, school. Acting. Well, we weren't acting. We oh. were learning. It was actually part of the, the – we had a curriculum. We got, we got graded and all yeah, that yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. Um, we yep. actually – however, yeah, it was part of the – and we got, got get dressed up in 18th century clothes. Yep. and Writing on the slate with Writing the on the slate boards. And, yeah, 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 yeah. I actually got <laughs> – and this will be – I'm sure you'll be surprised – I got to the end uh, at the end of the week. One of the things I got a, is a little, I've got a little. It's a little brass medal I've got somewhere still, and it was like basically the teacher said he wouldn't be much as a student, but I'd have him as a farm hand any day or so. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the classic, I'm not real bright, but I can lift heavy things. You know. What I mean? <laughs> oh, what a great keepsake! Oh yeah, man. Yeah, yeah I have to find that. That should, that should be in here actually. I have to find that. And and, and memories like that, they're so important. It's, Absolutely, you know, man. It's, it's it's the small things. You don't need you know. Growing up, we didn't have all the latest phones. Like we no, didn't have phones. No, they were attached to the wall still. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I did it. Did it. Did it. Did it. Oh, I fucked it up. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's start, again. start again. Press. Press the yeah, yeah, hang yeah. up button. Yeah. I tell you what, though, mate. And I'm sure you agree with me that I'm glad that uh, we got up to our shenanigans before social media was around. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we're, nice, we're, we're responsible uh, adults now that are trying to do our bit for the community. That's exactly right. Exactly right, mm. mate. So uh, down, so Canada down the east coast of the US, man, mm. that must so, be something else. I mean, the US is on my list. It's hard for me. I constantly, you know, Europe or the US first, I'm not too sure. Because I've only been, I've only been around Australasia mostly mm. for work, so yep. I haven't gone sort of north of the equator yet. Yeah. Uh, so you went to New York, did you? New York, man. Had to go to New York. Uh, you have to, man. Like oh, you got to, yeah. What was that like? I mean, I mean, especially you, an Aussie country boy, Hillview Primary, twenty eight people, drop you in New York City, which has got more people. It's more people living in that city than what Australia has, I think. Yeah, something crazy it's like crazy. that. Crazy. Yeah, and it just never stops. Never stops. And uh, not only that, uh, we were staying in Harlem. Oh, really? And we're walking up the street. We were the only white people walking up the street. Really? No, but. No, no, no one cares. No one cares. Yeah, no one cares. Well, the thing about I think the thing about most Aussies, mate, is that we're cool with people. Yeah, as long as you, yeah, g'day, mate, how you going, mate? As soon as you say g'day, mate, to anyone over there, they're like, hey, and straight away they're cool with you. Yeah, they, yeah. you know, there's no problem at all. Yeah. Well, it's like a dumb Aussie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here, man? I mean, you got to keep your wits about you. Absolutely, yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll take the piss out if they can. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what's the highlights? Yeah, did you have a hot dog, mate? I always, I just want to go to hot the... dog pizza. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I had to have those. Yeah. Um, I didn't go in a taxi because they cost too much. I was only a backpacker, so <laughs> yeah, I couldn't yeah, yeah. afford it. it was well, only, well, you're from Australia, mate. Going for a bit of a walk's not a problem, you know. What no, I mean? that's exactly right. Walked, walked all the way from Harlem all the way up through to Madison Square and then yeah. caught the train back. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you're on the subway. Like yeah, the subway was pretty cool. So yeah. um, it, it was actually interesting to have um, like. If there's a way to make a dollar in New York, someone's figured out a way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So there's street performers everywhere. Yeah, right. So they'll have um, guys jump on the subway in between stations and they'll put on a whole act. Some of them will do like Shakespeare or some of them will do acrobatics in the aisle with the, you know, as if the monkey bars for the uprights where you're standing. Wow. Yeah, it's just full and just on. with the hat at the hat, can you give us a buck, mate? Yep. Yep. If you liked it, tip us some money. If you're not, cool, enjoy the rest of your day. Wow. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine, like, you know, it's, I had to find my way into Brisbane City the other day, and I hadn't been in the in the West End for ages, and I was yep. like, "Geez, I'm a bit of a country mouse, mate." You know what I mean? I yep. sort of travel to and from, come back to Fernvale, and yep. I hang around out here mostly. Mm. I can't imagine what New York would have been like. It just would have been intense. Man. Four days was enough, though. Yeah, it was enough. Oh, I I actually had a headache by the end of it from just overabsorption of just colours and people and noise and smoke and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. So it was, it was pretty crazy, but yeah, absolutely loved it. Um, saw saw um, Barack Obama. Really? When he um, when he so was So what there. year was this? Ah, uh, now you're pushing me. It was Barack. Must have been oh eight or something. Like it was, that. Yeah, it was oh eight. I'd have to say it was oh eight. And um, yeah, so we walk along the um, the piers along the river, mm. and there's there's just a lot of activity. Like there's there's little gunboats going up and down. Um, there's a lot of police, and it's just like something's not right. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And being New York, you're always sort of cautious about it. Yeah. And I kept walking and got up onto the um, onto the bridge there, and then all of a sudden, here comes um, Marine One, Two, and Three. Oh, really? The yeah, choppers. Yeah, the yeah, choppers. Right. Yep. So down he comes and lands like on the piers, like where he'd only been twenty minutes earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah, 
So I got my little, had a little ha- um, camcorder at the time. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I zoomed right in to see what was going on. Yeah, right. So, yeah, that was unreal. But just, you know, the level Imagine of security that. around that, oh, know, yeah. around POTUS is unreal. But just being there for that moment too, like yeah. what a moment in time, you yeah. know what I mean? If you I mean, think I, it, I didn't particularly agree with some of the stuff that Obama did, but I mean, he's the president of the United States. So you got yeah, to, he's a president, yeah. You know, you got to have a, a little bit of a leader there. of the free world. Yeah, right? yeah, you got to, you got to, uh, got to pay some sort of respect there, don't you? Yeah. So where did you go from New York? Did you um, down in Miami? It was wow. it was holiday time. Yeah. So, so you went straight to Miami from New York. Yeah. So I um, jumped back on the Greyhound and went went down to Miami, which is, you know. America's pretty big, so it was, I think it was two days on the bus to get down to Miami. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so, st- you know, we had to stop in a few places. There's only one place we had trouble. Yeah. Um, so we'd, we'd bought these these Greyhound tickets, and it was a 60-day bus, North American pass. So basically, you can, jump, you, want. you can jump on a Greyhound bus anywhere in North America. Yeah. And no worries at all. All you had to do was flash this ticket. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we got to um, Jacksonville. And um, in in Florida. Anyway, there'd been a delay. Bus driver was sick or something. So like we about two or three hours, we were waiting um, for the next bus. Anyway, went to jump back on, and this new bus driver said, "You you you can't do that. You need a ticket." I said, "No, mate. We've just come all the way from Vancouver. Like we've done like eight thousand miles in a, on a bus using these tickets. Doing these tickets, it's been fine. You're the only person that said no. He goes, no, no." You need to go get a printed out ticket. So like, right over. He's like, we're leaving in two minutes. Anyway, so run back inside. I'm ready to just start breaking something. Yeah. And I was I was pretty upset. And um, got to the got to the counter, and there's one person in front of us. But the lady at the ticket counter was the slowest. Of course it was. Lady <laughs> ever to use a keyboard. Like, my Single dad, figure. my dad was pretty hopeless on a keyboard. He was a speed typer compared to her. <laughs> so here she was, this this lady with these like three inch long fake nails, yeah. doing the whole finger circle uh, dot, finger circle dot. Yeah, right. Uh, I I felt like jumping the counter, pushing around the way, and just going Brr, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course I didn't. So you made it on the bus. Made it on the bus. Well, the bus driver was actually going to go, and all the people. Um, that were on the bus. Oh, you've been with them. You've been on the bus with them. Yeah, yeah, because they, they're all going down to Miami. Yeah, right. We were, we were the only white people on the bus. Yeah. Um, it's the cheapest way to travel around. So yeah, you know, a lot of low socioeconomic people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great people. But they, so you would have been knowing you, you would have been chatting to them, and you would have made of some them. mates. Yeah, you would have made some them. mates. So like, yeah. yeah, they're like, where's Maddie? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So th- this drivers want to go, and they're like, uh, uh-uh, uh, we're not going without them. Yeah. And I was, I was like, wow, that's just, that's unreal. And that, that was a, a turning point in my life. Was it really? It was a turning point in my life. Yeah, because you, you saw the value of a, a connection. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I was, I was in huge debt. And like, oh, man, we had some laughs on that bus. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, oh, just had to be there in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, it's one of those things, one of those times. I'll, I'll be 99 there. years old and, and still, still giggling about get that a bus smile. ride. Yep. So what was... Uh, Miami like I mean we obviously we have a we, everyone has and you know and this is the thing you have a skewed viewpoint or perspective of America and Miami I suppose and everyone knows what Miami's built on you know mm-hmm. what I mean like it's not a it's it's pretty common knowledge of all the banks there and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. and what was it like a dirty Spanish version of the Gold Coast a dirty Spanish version of the Gold Coast I love it right um and I say that because Everyone you'd talk to yeah. would speak to you in Spanish first. Oh, really? To see? No, to... no, no. Seriously, that's what everyone spoke. Yeah, right. Everyone that I come across spoke Spanish. Spoke Spanish first. Go to the supermarket. They speak Spanish to you. You get to go, no comprende. No, they just swap back to English. Yeah, right. Cause yeah. Like all the Cubans, basically. A lot of Cubans, a lot of Mexicans. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a lot of Latinos. Yeah. Puerto Ricans. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like it. There's no problem with it, but no. I just I just don't speak Spanish. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. not comprende. So I, I had a um, like I, I bought a big cowboy hat, of course. Yeah. When I was in Canada, and I, I wore that all the way through, you know, New York, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it, you know, there wasn't a day it wasn't on my head. <laughs> and um, you still got it? Still got it. That's my workout now. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. so it's a bit bit battered now. Like she's seen a day, but yeah, if that hat could talk, we probably don't need it to. Yeah, no, it's got some stories that one. <laughs> I love it so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um. Yeah, I was walking towards the beach and uh, wearing this big black hat 
and um, this this big Texan looking cowboy like if you can imagine like a Marlboro man sort of image yeah you know, big handlebars moustache and he had a cowboy hat on himself and um, I, I was walking through the car park and I heard this Spanish yelling out I'm like I'm looking around and he's like you know gibbering off in Spanish at me and I'm like no comprende and um, he's like is that your pickup truck over there partner <laughs> <laughs> I'm like no nah, mate I'm a backpacker Anyway, um, he's like, oh, I just saw the hat. I thought that truck might have been yours. I'm like, yeah. I wish. Yeah, 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 I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we got, we got talking about it. And yeah, it was cool. Like, spoke in English the rest of the time. But yeah, right. Ev- you know, everyone just automatically starts speaking Spanish. And that's the thing about... Uh, well, everyone that I come across anyway. Yeah, right. But the thing about the um, the pickup trucks over there, because obviously, yeah. you know, I know, I remember that do the Canadian bloke, Jeff, like we, yeah. we had one of the first V8 Land Cruiser Utes over in PNG. Yeah. And I'm... You know, I'm frothing over it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's yeah. how cool is this? He's, knees, he's yeah. like, mate, I could drive this ute into the tray of my ute. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. He goes, mate, he showed me a picture. He goes, I press a button and there's steps mm. that come out because you can't. It's, ste- it's that big. It's that big. You it's can't like an get F650 up. or something. Yeah, you can't yeah. get into the bloody thing. Yeah. You know, they're, they're mad about their trucks yep. over there, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They give a, give a whole new meaning to the word ute. Yeah. So how long did you stay in uh, Miami? I was only there for a week. Yeah, but again, that was enough. And then time to move back on again. Come home, or where'd you go from there? Um, back to Germany for a bit, and then come home. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, and I mean, there must have been. Well, you've already mentioned one formative experience of getting out of Australia and travelling, like mm-hmm. the, the experience on the bus and those guys looking after you. But there must have been many more that. So many. Uh, you must have come back a different bloke after. I doing mean, that. I, I um, I've got friends to this day. Um, I was up in. Um, we're head- heading up into the uh, towards the Yukon, yeah. And um, we were camping there, and this um, I was oh, it was a wet day, so we'd gone into the laundromat to to wash some clothes and put them in the dryer. Yeah. Um, spent a few bucks on the dryer because it wasn't going to dry outside. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's precious precious dollars as a backpacker. Yeah. And um, we'll dry clothes. You need clothes. Man. You need clothes, so that's why we had to do it. Yeah. And um, anyway, this bloke walks in. And he, he says, I like your hat. And he was a Texan. Hmm. And so we just start, sparked up a conversation and and um, found out, you know, where I was from, had a yarn, all good, right, I, well, we might see you along the road. Hmm. Anyway, so we got get on the bus later on and kept going and we, you know, we passed them on the road and they were waving to us as we, as we go on past and, you know, smiling like an idiot. Yeah. Anyway, get up to uh, Whitehorse. And we found out that was as far as we could go on the Greyhound. There's no Greyhound that went further north. Yeah. So we were a bit bit bummed about that because we wanted to try and get to this Dawson City. Yeah, right, right. So anyway, got there and um, I decided to go fly fishing. Mm-hmm. And I was coming back and um, I was back near the hostel and I, I hear this pickup truck behind me and it's sort of just slowing right down. Mm. I'm like, what's going on here? Old mate's mate? noticed your hat. And... It's so, old mate, he's seen me. Yeah. He's gone, hey, partner. And uh, sparked up conversation again. He goes, so so where are you off to now? And I said, oh, well, we're trying to get to Dawson City, but the, bu- the bus isn't going to take us there. Yeah. He goes, well, hell, we're going that way, so jump on in. Yeah, right, so you got a free ride up so to Dawson he, City. We hitched a ride with him up to Dawson. They awesome, man. Lovely people. So, yeah, right. so, you know, that'd be what we were referred to here as grey nomads. Yeah. They just, you know, just tracking pack around. up their fifth wheeler every year and, yeah, when it got too cold where they were, they'd try and go and go to the warm, warm yeah. spot. Yep. So, but again, and this is this is a key. And obviously, you know, you've listened to the podcast and we've spoken, you know, offline and on the podcast yep. about this. You be friendly to people. You respect them. You you give them five minutes of your time. They will then pay you that respect back. Exactly. And that's ninety nine percent of people, regardless of creed, colour, religion, it exactly. doesn't nothing matters, man. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. You show people respect, you treat them as an equal Exactly. And they will treat you exactly the same yep. way. Because that's that's human nature, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's a couple of experiences that you shared there that are a pure example of that. Mm. You know? Exactly. So you would have so you came back to Australia. How old were you then? You would have I was still pretty young. Mm. Um I would have been twenty four Four, yeah, twenty three, twenty four. When I'd come back, yeah. So I was still, I was still pretty young, and um, and then I was working at a um, at a saddlery. 
in Brisbane. Yeah. Um, Greg Grant Sadlery. Mm-hmm. And um, I worked there for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. I, I survived that long. Like we were living in the city at that stage. Um, didn't particularly like living in the city, but you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got out of that and started working away, going out west, working on the roads. Yep. So, so by this stage, um, you know, 2011 floods had happened. Yeah, right. Um, All the roads are mass, yeah. mass damage across everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. It was unbelievable, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you just can't fathom the devastation. Like, you know, driving back through Brisbane on the first night before even the, the worst of the flooding had happened, mm. And there's not a light on anywhere. No, it was, it was crazy, man. My brother was in Fairfield. That's where I was living. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the funny thing was he had some dodgy people living next door. So, you know, because uh, he's my brother, we normally had a way to get in each other's houses without yeah. a key. You, yeah. know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, however, what we'd done, because he was a bit worried he was working FIFA, we'd actually secured his house. Mm-hmm. So, A, I couldn't get in. And but it, you, you were here, mate. It happened so quickly. Yeah. Um, by the time, because I was in um, Ellen Grove, in Waco there, yeah. and by the time I realised that I had to get to his place, couldn't get through, man. Mm. Yeah, all of an uh, um, Oxley was under, like yep. it was just a 300 just, metres of water, man. just happened. Unbelievable, yep. you know? Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, well, he had, because he was in a yeah, two-storey apartment, it went through the first storey sort of chest. Yeah, high, yep, yep. You know? I mean, the, the shops at Fairfield, where the coals is, they had like a metre and a half of water go through that. Yeah, I know. And that's yeah. not even down low. It's, no, it's, it's up on it's a little up, rise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it, it was crazy. The amount of water, it, it's one of those things, if you didn't see it or experience it, you, oh. you, you, it's hard to explain. Yeah, you know there I mean? was kids doing backflips off the roof of the 7-Eleven fuel station into the water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta love Australia, eh? Right? So I uh, couldn't blame him. Like, yeah. why not? Absolutely. Well, life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, mate. That's what happens, isn't it? You know what I mean? Absolutely. So 2011 floods and you started working down the roads and uh, yeah worked away at um, mainly at around St George. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did the roads down to Deer and Bandy and then um, out to Bolan, yeah. um, Mungandai, all those places. Really good, great crew of blokes. Yeah, um, hard work too, man. You know what I mean? It, it was hard work and there's some some long days, but shit, we had some fun while we we're doing it. Yeah, yeah just yeah. just a good crew. Yeah, you find a good crew, mate. I mean, I say I work FIFO, you know, ten years pretty much on yep. on and off. Uh, and yeah, you get a good crew. It's actually a pleasure being out there. You know mm. what I mean? The camaraderie and all that sort of stuff. It's yep. one of those that yeah we've talked about tribe before. I know yep. you've talked about. It. We talked about that. It's uh, something that we're missing. You know mm. what I mean? You can get that sort of thing if you've got a good crew of boys. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was um, there was about there was four of us primarily, mm-hmm. um, and then there's a few others that would rotate in and out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's four of us that mainly stick together, mm-hmm. and we, and you know we'd knock off work and then go go bow hunting in the afternoon or go fishing yeah right um, so I, I started off taking the bow out mm-hmm. um, just to do a bit of bow fishing yeah shoot a few carp because there's plenty of carp out there mm. and then um, plenty carp. yeah and then one of the spray drivers um, he's like oh well, I'm into bow hunting too so we hooked up and then the foreman said well that looks like fun yeah, I'll get a bow as well so he ended up buying my old, my old bow and I bought a new one yeah and then um, like at, at the start they like he'd just borrow mine so it was quite lucky he had the same draw length as me yeah for being able to shoot so we could like it was just, just uncanny yeah how accurate we could both be with the same bow mm. when normally they're such a customizable thing absolutely yeah, and yeah. then the supervisor out there he he fitted into the bow of the spray driver oh right so, so we'd be able to just out, the four of us out there take turns having shots I only need two bows basically. I only need two bows but then yeah the boss up um the foreman upgraded so he bought my bow, I bought a new one. So then we'd go out, um, yeah, we started doing a bit of bow hunting and chasing pigs and goats. And wow. Yeah, it was yeah, great fun. Unbelievable. Mm. So how long, how long are you out doing the roads for? Um, did uh, two years out there. Yeah, right. So we're getting pretty, we're coming up all in the years, mate. So Yeah, so mate, the, oh, like the, I'm jumping a few years as yeah, we go. No, like, that's fine, mate, that's know, fine. So I suppose just to, I can see... A diverse range of experiences and all that sort of stuff that you, you're telling us about tonight was the, and obviously now you've decided to step up and do your part. Mm-hmm. Along this process, was there thoughts of that, or were you still keeping an eye on things? What, what, what well, was I've always kept an eye on things. I'd always considered politics for something I might might like to try. You know, maybe in my fifties, right? When I, you know, down the track. Um, but it's gotten to the point recently where it's like. Australia as I love it won't be here. It'll be it'll be gone. Mm. It'll be something else, some other connotation. And 
for you know, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know if it's going if that's going to be better or worse. I think it it'll get worse. I think it can get a lot worse. Inevitably, things get worse before they get better, mate. Unfortunately. It, well, it, absolutely, and I don't think it'll get better because I don't um, I don't believe whoever if it goes as bad as what it possibly could, there'll be no interest for the people of Australia to be have any benefit. And you're totally right, mate. I think the thing is is that. I've said for years as far as politics goes is that you don't vote for the person you like in Australia you vote for the person you hate the least mm, that's it there's there's really been no one for a very long time that majority of Australians could honestly get behind yep. and and believe that they are truly for the people yep. um, and not for themselves exactly uh, and look th- there's so much evidence to surround that mm. so let, let's fast forward mate I mean is there anything so you're on the road crew what else do we do after that well um, it was at, at that time um, I lost my father yes um, so that was that just absolutely rocked my world from yep. had basically just over nearly nearly four months from diagnosis to death yes you told that story at 50 didn't you I think you might, I have, might have touched on yeah, it yeah you might yeah. have touched on it yeah so yeah that, that rocked me Unbelievably so, I can only imagine, mate. Can mm. only imagine, yeah. And um, you know, an event like that, you know, my father was, he was, he was my idol growing up. I just wanted to be like dad. That you know, it's part of the reason why I got into the into the horses so hard is because, you know, when when dad was a young fella, he was into the horses too. Yeah, right. So he worked on a thoroughbred stud and yeah, and you know, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to be like dad from when I was little. Yeah. And um, I just followed those footsteps, and then, and then I lost him. I didn't know. Didn't know what to do. What mate. to do then? Bit of a loose end. So I, th- I thought, well, I could either take one path or I can do another path, and one path wasn't leading to a good direction. No. So I stayed on the positive side, and yep. um, you know, it, it took a while. Uh, I went through a couple of rough patches there, but I pulled out of it, and here I am today. Here you are today. So, so any anything of importance that is is shaped what you're doing today between the roads and what we want to get into? Yeah. Well, um, I met. I met people that got me into the polo cross. Yep. And then from there, um, I met the manager of the farm that I'm, I'm working on now. Yep. And that's how I got the job out there. And so I've been there for three over three and a half years now. And it's a beautiful spot, mate. I love it. I mean, you know, it, it feels like home. To uh, you know, to our listeners, with the studio upgrade, actually, there's a photo of the uh, looking off the hill there. That that lovely landscape mm-hmm. you've got at your place that we went and had it checked out before we recorded fifty and. Yep. What a place, mate! I actually can't wait to get back there. Yeah, personally, you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I can't, You know, and to to live there, you know, I can only imagine. Yeah. And it, it's one thing I just I'll never take for granted. Never take it for granted, and you no. can't. You can't no. live it on a place like that. Yeah. yeah, you know, you get up there and you can see Mount Lindsay and Mount Barney and Mount Maroon, and yeah. then you go up onto another hill and you can look across and you can see O'Reilly's mm-hmm. up in the national park. And yeah, it's just it's a great spot. It must do um, obviously living and working there. It's obviously where you've made your decision to do what you're doing now. Was it the being in the bush and being on the land and that, the perspective that that gives you that finally made you decide to yeah, step that, up? Yeah, that brought it home. You know, our farmers are just getting a, a really rough deal. They are, yeah. And, you know, I, I'm i fortunate enough that, you know, in my position, it's not a family farm. Mm. So we're not affected, you know, we're not as affected if the prices aren't as good. Yes. You know, it's not a family's livelihood at stake. Mm-hmm. But there'd be plenty around you but that is. But there's a lot around. I grew up, you know, there's a lot of families I grew up with. Mm. Um, you know, live that, or, that, that had or die by the, by yeah, the crop, basically. There's, there's, I, I grew up with the kids that grew up on a farm and then, you know, the farm had to close. Wow. They've had to move off. Yeah. You know, generational farms. Yeah, 10 generations and you know, gone. Yeah. Like that. Unreal. So, and, you know, the deregulation of the dairy industry, like Christmas Creek, where I grew up, mm-hmm. um, it, it was a, a really strong dairy dairy area. The whole scenic rim is a strong dairy, dairying area. I think someone said before deregulation, there was around nearly 850 dairy farms yeah. in the in the region, mm-hmm. and now we're down to under 200. Under 200. Yeah. So what percentage of our milk is is coming out of Australia? Is it all of it still, or is it is this milk coming in? Okay, so most of your powder milks are coming in from overseas, and your UHT milks. Yep, but your 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 fresh milk. Your fresh milk's generally Australian. Okay, but the problem is there, you know, as we've seen with the, this dollar a litre milk, mm. 
it, it's cutting cutting the throat of the of the farmer. Yeah, absolutely. It you know it's not viable to create a product for a dollar or for anything. less than what you're getting paid for it. Yes, which is what they're for trying more to than do. what you're getting paid for. Yes, it. yes, yeah. which is what they're trying to do. Yeah, which is what they've been doing. Yeah. I mean, they've just put it up to a dollar ten now, but it's it's nowhere near enough. At at inflation rates, we should be paying for for to be fair to our dairy farmers, it should be a dollar fifty a litre. Well, I think a dollar fifty six. Yeah, well, there's the uh, is it the Norco milk, which is the farmer owned consortium or whatever it is. That's the milk that we buy. Uh, that's the milk that we buy here mm-hmm. at the house, and yep. it's like three dollars fifty for two liters, which yep. it goes to the farmers, and I'm I'm totally fine with that. You know yeah. what I mean? I think that's the right thing to do. I mean, you know, the the money, the dollars are going back to the farmers, but the big problem with some of those other companies like Norco is Australian farmer owned, mm-hmm. but the likes of your Pauls and your dairy farmers. They're actually owned by foreign companies. Well, so we, we've sold off most of our foreign so, assets, yeah. So and most of our Australian company. Yeah, so that's that's the processor. Mm. So the processors are foreign owned. So any profits the processors are making, they're not going back to the. They're farmers. going back to the farmers. They're yeah. going overseas. So the farmers get a flat rate. They're getting a flat rate. Yeah, right. which is yeah, not barely unsustainable, unsustainable. Which is why they've been dropping away. Yeah, because you can't keep it running for the flat rate that yep. they're being paid. Yep. So, twenty nineteen, mm-hmm. here we are. You are going to be part of this election cycle, is that correct? Certainly will be. Yeah, and you're representing the seat of seat of right. Yeah. So, and which which encompasses um, from the Gold Coast hinterland across to uh, Cunningham's Gap on the Great Dividing Range. Yep. So, which is in between the scenic rim and Warwick. Yep. And it ends like a few hundred meters down the road or something, doesn't it? Like your, it's not far from here that your electric runs out is that correct yeah into um just down the road to Laidley mm. so not not very far away so for, for the southeast it's quite a big area for the grand scheme of Queensland it's quite no, quite it's, small it's you nothing. Know. yeah 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 my running mate in the neighbouring electorate Anthony Wallace for Maranoa mm-hmm. his goes from Cunningham's Gap all the way out to the Queensland New South Wales uh, Queensland South Australia border yeah and right. then up to Longreach oh wow like it's, That's a chunk. It's bigger than a, some European countries. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's huge. Unreal. So I don't envy his job, the poor bugger. So you chose to run with the Cutter Party. Mm-hmm. And what was what was the decision process behind that? Is it because they're more of an independent party? or It's it basically come down to... I, I read through a lot of the party's policies and I'd always liked Cutter. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he was, you know... He's, it reminds me of the old country party. That's what it, exactly. Yeah. You know, it, so it's always resonated with me. Uh-huh. Well, that's where you're from, isn't it? That's where I'm from. Yeah. Um, and then you know, I, I think Bob Cat is a, a great bloke. He wears his heart on his sleeve. He'll tell it exactly how it is. And in this day and age, you got to respect someone who does that. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you'd you'd rather get the genuine article than not. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, as far as I was concerned. His his word was was good enough for me. Fair enough. Going through the policies, I was like, "Hey, this is just Mickey Mouse." It speaks to you. It speaks to me. Yeah, and look, I think the thing is, mate, is that uh, I we do need an alternative. Absolutely. We do, and need that's what an it's all about. It's about having choices. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that's the. You know, I I did take notice the last federal election, and we were lined up down at the primary school like we are, you know, mm-hmm. like cattle trying to got to do our voting. Yeah. And not a single person, you know, I was sort of tuning in to the conversations. Mm. No one was talking about politics, man. Mm. We're only there because we have to be That's there. exactly right. There's, you know, and realistically, that's affecting us on a day-to-day basis. Mm. We need to be involved in it. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you talk, and I'll be honest, you're talking to a bloke, I think I was 18 or 19, it was the first election that I voted. I voted for my dog. Because yep. that's, that's actually who I thought would do a better job. Yep. Elvis, Elvis was a dingo cross cattle dog, mate. He was a brilliant dog. He would have done a better job, you yeah, know what I mean? Absolutely. And look, that's that's me being totally honest. Yeah. Uh, however, obviously, as the years go on, it's something that I'm becoming more curious about. And when I heard you stepping up, mate, that's you know total respect. And uh, you know, to, to put yourself on a line, I suppose you have said that you were an uh, what are you, an introverted type of person, mm-hmm. so. What what are, what's are some of the things you face to even just do this, mate? You know what I mean. Like I think some of the boys would like to hear about the fact that where you were from personality to all day you were, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies today. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it you know it doesn't come naturally to me. 
but I think of I think I've been pretty lucky. It it feels to me that my whole life has been rolling in towards this one situation. Like it just it feels right. Yep. That it's happening. So I I, I enjoy talking to people. Yeah. Um, I've got no problem. I love I love new information. I love reading. I love absorbing. You know, synthesizing data. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it just it motivates me. Yeah. Then you combine that with the chance to, you know, you get, Rome won't be built in a day. You know, I've got visions that could take a long time to come to, to fruition. Come to fruition, but you got to have them. You got to have them. Absolutely. You got to have goals. Work, you got to work you're, towards something. Absolutely, absolutely. So, how have you been going, mate? Like on the on the trail and stuff. Have you been a bit of a personal question, I suppose? But facing your demons as such, you know what I mean. You must have a bit of nerves. A bit, is it becoming more natural to you, or it's slowly becoming? More, I won't say natural, more comfortable. Yeah. You know, putting myself out there on social media, you know, I've always put opinions forward. Yeah. But I, I never try and dig too deep or bear too much. Yeah. I like to try and keep things as honest as I can. Yep. I don't like anything fake. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've made a bit of a game with the campaign. It's called Where's Matt in the Hat? So Which is your, your big white hat that you, you so, yeah, was look, on Instagram tonight? Absolutely. So a friend of ours has, um, has come on board and said, hey, she made this event as just as, as a joke because mm. I started putting my core flute signs up and then she took a picture and said, hey, where's Matt in the hat? Yeah, right. And we thought, hey, there's an idea. That's a, that's a slogan there, where's yeah. Matt in the hat? Hey, hashtag that. And um, yeah, so we're slowly building this bit of a game around the whole campaign just to make it a bit more fun. Oh, you've got to have fun, mate. You've got to have fun. Like, yeah. obviously, it's a serious thing that you're doing. However, if you can't be a genuine Aussie bloke and, and have a bit of a giggle and yeah. have a bit of a laugh and take the piss out of yourself, yeah. then, then what are you doing? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I think, and I think that would definitely, a game like that would speak to the people as well. Yeah. yeah. Like, like today, um, I, was, I was at the, at the carp comp down watching the way in. Yeah. Anyway, um, one, one of the farmers is, who was, counting the um, fish um, as they're coming through. He's, he stopped and he's grabbed his phone. He's just turned around. He's taking a picture of me. I said, what are you doing? He goes, where's Matt in the hat? <laughs> <laughs> Matt's down in the car car. <laughs> Well, there you so go, mate. Like, That's proof that it's working, man. It's working. So, Absolutely. You know, if people can have a bit of fun and, and enjoy it, I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't about me. No. It's yeah. about the people of my electorate. Mm-hmm. Having someone who understands them, I'm from the area. Yeah, I understand the people. Yeah, you know we can be a pretty quirky bunch of people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we all are, mate. I mean, you know, one of the the cause of this uh, podcast is grasp your eccentricity. Absolutely. Mate. You know what I mean? You know, there's you know growing up, I can't remember countless times where someone had, you know has moved into the area that's been there for twenty odd years, yeah. and and the local will say, "Well, you're still not a local." Yeah, you know, they've yeah. been there living there for twenty years, and they're still not a local. Still not a local. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, when we're in the NT, it's like if you if you survive five wet seasons, yep, you you might, yeah, maybe, yeah, kinda, not really, but you, yeah, yeah, you you'd might, be accepted. You'd be accepted. Yeah, You're not a local. At yeah, all. <laughs> you, you, and I'm and I'm not saying in saying that I'm not saying that you have to be born in an area to be able to represent them. Oh, definitely not. But what I am saying is you understand them a hell of a lot more. Yes. If you well, you've got to be able to connect to your base. And exactly. if you're, you, you've chosen to represent an area that you grew up in, mate. Yep. You know the area. You, you, I know the people. You know the people. Mm. You've ridden the tracks. Yep. You've done that. You know what I mean? You've been part of that area for yep. a very long time. Yeah. And it's only right that someone from that area should represent that area. That's the way I think. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. So tell us a bit about what, what, what are you, what are you, what's your plans, mate? What are you doing? You know, what, what do we got, what do we got on the ticket for, uh, for 2019 so we can get a bit of an understanding? Obviously, We've spoken a lot about horses, mm. so that's obviously something you're definitely interested in. What? Absolutely. So we don't have very much infrastructure in um, our electorate for right mm. that's been specifically put there for the people of right. Mm. I remember growing up, we used to have the Country and Horse Festival, yep. and there was always talk that we, we'd be the equestrian capital of Australia, right? which everyone loved. They jumped on board. Yeah, nothing and happened. We had this whole festival, and then you know one thing led to another, and... We were supposed to get this U-boot, all this equestrian infrastructure, mm-hmm. and nothing happened. It ended, yeah, up, right. ended up going down to Tamworth, I believe. So, and then it, it's all, the whole, and the GFC then happened, you know, a couple of years after that, and it all sort of fell away. Yeah. But we're building it back up, the equestrian numbers now, like every second person's got a horse. Yeah. And I'm in the, in the outer areas. Yeah. You know, 
the horse, the, the equestrian clubs are getting stronger by the year. Mm. It's about time we've got something for the equestrian people instead of having to travel a couple of hours to go somewhere to, to do their equestrian event. Mm. Have one have a hub there. Have for, a hub. Yeah. For and and not just for local events for world class events. Absolutely, they have international events, but make it a destination for equestrian events. Yeah, we're we're so lucky. We're like we're an hour from the Brisbane from Brisbane Airport. We're an hour from Gold Coast. So it's no, not far. It's, it's a great spot for international events. Oh, it's un- and it's an unbelievably beautiful part of Australia, Absolutely. mate. Absolutely. I've travelled a lot around this big brown land, yep. and it is it is a special part out there, yep. mate. It's a lovely spot. It man. is, and we're so lucky, and Absolutely. people take it for granted. Um, as I said, I, I, I look at those hills, and every day, you know, I still don't take it for granted. Yeah, take a second to appreciate it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Well, that's why that's why the pick's on the wall, mate. Yep. It's such a, it, it was such a seminal moment in the podcast, but mm-hmm. it was also, you know, well and well and truly worthy of the... Worthy of capturing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd like to get the, um, yeah, the, this equestrian hub happening mm-hmm. um, so you can, you know, be able to facilitate polo and polo cross, yep. show jumping, um, three-day eventing, dressage. Hacking. So have like like fields like you like you know, have footy field but for so, horses. Yeah, sort of thing. so you'll have big outdoor fields and yeah. then you also have a indoor arena, uh-huh. so you can have indoor events. So you know we'll be able to be able to have a big rodeo. Yeah, right. Um, get get the world's best bull riders to come over. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, instead of the PBR being up in Brisbane Entertainment Centre, let's let's have the PBR down in Bow Desert. Where the people are actually most interested in it. We're, we've had some of Australia's best cowboys come out of that our area. region. Yeah. So it's only fitting. Like, why would you want to go and try and, you know, you go up to Brisbane Entertainment Centre and have an event. It can take up to two hours to bloody get out of there. Exactly. It's a nightmare. Yeah. So bring it down to Bud Hazard. Bring it local. Bring it local. Have the people there. And, you know, tourism dollars will flow out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's, that's really awesome, man. I think that... Yeah, again, I'm not from that world. However, I can understand that a facility like that, especially for people in that area, mm. that that's their passion, mm. then they would get behind it and make it special. Yep, I believe so. Absolutely. So I really think it's it, it's going to be a special piece of infrastructure mm. um, that we have a work towards delivering for our people. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And obviously, working on a farm and working on a property, mm. you're very passionate about the farmers and what what you know. And look. Those that don't understand and haven't been on the land and seen the effects the droughts have and all those sorts of things, you know, only the, the, the massive amount of water went through North Queensland not long ago where they were literally shipping water out to feed their cattle and they lost, what, a million head over a, a week yeah. or something like yeah. that. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I've got a good mate who was working on a property up in the Gulf and, yeah, he'd, he'd come down from a, for a wedding and the week before he was putting out lick to try and keep cattle alive and he's come back for the wedding and then... Um, yeah, the events happened while he's down here, and um, you know the cattle that he was trying to keep alive were some of them were dead. It just got too wet and too cold too quickly. And that's Australia. And that's Australia. Yeah. So what what can what can what can uh, what can we do for the farmers, mate? And I, I and I did see that the the cattle party was trying to help the farmers up north, and they were doing a lot of really good work there, and I, I can appreciate that. Yeah. Well, Bob Bob Cattle, um, you know, dragged um, Scott Morrison up there to actually go around and see, not just do a flyby and give a wave out the window, but actually go and see the get, farmers. Get boots on the ground. Get actually. boots on the ground and yeah. actually, you know, smell the stench. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you cannot fathom the stink. Decomposing cattle uh, by uh, the hundreds of thousands. I, I know a bloke that was um, um, Marty Bella from the Green Shirts movement. He was going up there for a working beat, you know, to try and help out. Mm. And from about 50 k's out of Winton, he could sm- all he could smell was death. Oh, just man. stench. You can't even imagine it. You just can't. It's you know a once in a, hopefully it's only a once in a lifetime event. Yeah. But you know that that amount of water, um, from going from drought to having that amount of water, that should have been able instead of going out to the ocean, we should have been able to save that water. Should be able to capture it somehow. Should yeah. been should have been able to capture it. It was actually and a conversation we were. I was having with my brother not yesterday, the day before. Yeah. You know why can't we capture these massive amounts of water and how? How can we channel that? You know what I mean. Like it's uh, it's it's a that would be that's a massive project in itself. However, something because Australia is such a fickle country. Yeah. You know, one year we've got plenty of water, and then we don't have water for three years. You yep. know what I mean? And we've all, as Australians, experienced the extremes of the conditions here. Mm-hmm. There's got to be a way to do that. If yep. we can, if we can pipe gas and oil around the country, we can pipe water because it's a, exactly. it's one of those things. Without water, we die, mate. You exactly. Know what I mean? And I think the thing is. The next one I want to talk to you about is that without farmers making quality food, we also die. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, and th- and there's such a disconnect now between you know the, 
urban environments and the rural environments. Yes, absolutely. Um, Always has been, but I think it's a greater divide now because of the amount of population concentrated in those areas. Yeah, and you know, and it's too easy for um, food to be imported from overseas now. So you know, you, you don't appreciate when it, you know, how great a quality our food actually is here. We absolutely, have, we yeah. have world leading standards on food production and quality, yeah. quality control. You know, to be, imp- you know, that's how we got the white spot in was from bringing things in from overseas. Yeah. You know, the prawn farmers had been screaming, don't let imported um, crustaceans in. Because of the disease. Of because of, because of the disease. Of, you know, they're absolute cesspools that they're coming from. Yeah. They're, they're not it, coming from wild caught or freshly farmed like we are. Yeah. It's disgusting, the conditions that most of the food from overseas is grown just in. big, disgusting tanks. Oh, it's just pure filth. Yeah. And I think it... Uh, is it really, is it just a quest to make a bit more of a dollar, mate? You know what I mean? Is it uh, the, the people, uh, they make more money bringing stuff in from overseas? Well, is it's, it's all line? part of this neoliberalism of corporations owning everything and, yeah. you know, making dollars. Monopolies, yeah. And it's it's disgraceful. And what the, we should be, what should be working towards is actually having, instead of Australia being a, you know, global leader in mining, we should be a food and fibre superpower. Which we could be. Which we easily could be. Yeah. We could be both, and this is the thing, you know what I mean? I don't think we are in a unique spot in Australia mm. where we could actually look after ourselves if we wanted to. We, we have everything yeah. within our borders, food, fuel, you know, mining, yep. minerals, everything. Yep. We don't necessarily need anything externally. Exactly. However, you know, in, in the quest to line the pockets of people, they've mm. decided to, you know, and, and see in a lot of, even mining, mate, I mean, that's something I was in for a while. We send the best iron ore overseas, mm-hmm. and then get shit back for it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like yep. it's 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 just it's terrible. You exactly. Know what I mean? And the, the so the farmers, mate. What can we do for these guys? You think more uh, conglomerate like Norco, or do you, what do you think is the way forward to help these guys out and get it get it in front of in front of more people? I think it's awareness. I think is the issue. I think the way forward really is to um, is it, not to be going t- towards massive conglomerates mm. but keeping it families yes you know families contributing together you know what what they make put chip it all in together to make a, a gross amount of product yes um, so you're saying like three or four farms getting together and and uh ensuring their product is understood the quality is understood and getting it to market in that manner exactly so th- there's that little co-op and yeah. you know communities grow around that absolutely and I, I strongly believe and this is a message i'm trying to get across through my campaign, is strong communities equal a strong nation. Absolutely, they do. And I, the problem is, I think, at the moment, is we've, we've lost sense of community. You have. You know, I think, I was, I was discussing, we were talking to my brother the other day, we had quite a long discussion about a few things. And, mm. you know, when we were kids, man, in Ballarat, you know, we'd play on the street. There'd be a cricket match in the middle yep. of the street. We'd, you know, the barbecue would come out and the yep. whole neighbourhood, you know, you, you yep. didn't have to worry about going away because the neighbourhood would look after your house for mm. you. You know what I mean? You played with the kids in the street, you yep. know, like... It's we don't do that anymore. No, you know I think the technology that's allowing us to have this awesome conversation yep. is one thing. However, yep. it's also sort of tearing us apart, as we yeah. as we've spoken about. You Abs- know, it's, it's isolating us more. And the, one of the things we are missing is community. Mm. Absolutely, know? and and embracing that mm. community. You know, I mean, even in Ballarat, I remember the, well, that was sort of country back in the eighties, just still semi. You know, there's a guy that used to come around in a truck, and he had fresh fruit and veg that used to come round. Yeah, and uh, Deliver the fresh fruit and veg, man. Yeah, yep. You know what I mean? I mean, and there's there's a guy up in North Queensland. Um, um, he's an immigrant guy, and he's been doing it for nearly thirty years. Every fortnight, he packs up his truck and does you know a couple of thousand kilometres on a trip through all these bush towns, delivering fresh fruit. Yeah. And yeah, you know, that's the lifeblood of those communities. Cause Absolutely. That they don't have a shopping centre down the road. No. You know, most of the time it's the pub and the post office is the bank, is the general store. Yeah. All and in one and building. There's, there's X amount in the general store and that's it. Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, you know, th- those, those sort of people who go to drive three or four hours to a, a bigger town mm. and that buy a one month's big worth. Shop. Yeah, one big shop. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So you think co-ops is the go, mate? You think trying to get the farmers to get get a community together and promote their product? It It's... You know, it's such a fine balance. You got to be careful with co-ops too, because then they they can become greedy as well, and then try and undercut each other. Yes. The big problem is is when people aren't happy with their their fair share. Yes. They're trying to get more. Yeah. 
Um, and you know, how do you combat that? I mean, is it a resource issue? Is it making sure quality of resource? Well, I don't think socialism is the answer. No, I don't think so either. <laughs> that's that's not a conversation for now. No, right? definitely not. Um, uh, look, someone someone um, brought brought up um, about live export, and it, I hadn't thought about it. Um, they said, "Oh, what, you know, do you understand why live export happens over to Indone- the likes of Indonesia? Why we ship our cattle live?" And I said, well, they don't have very good refrigeration from what I understand. He goes, yes, that as well. But he said, they've got an industry beside, in, in Indonesia, beside the live export, where so they, our cattle will get shipped over there, go to an, a, a um, big feedlot. Then all the small farmers around that area will cut their bits of grass or their cane or put their scraps together yep. and go and sell it to the feedlot to feed the cattle. Oh, so it's supporting another industry. It's supporting it? another industry in their own country. Ah. We're not doing that here. Wow. We're not trying to look after our little guys. No. That's the problem. Yes, right. They're trying to, you know, we're too busy trying to kick them in the ass, get rid of them, so someone else can make an extra dollar. Yeah. It's not right. No. And well, communities, uh, little things make big things grow, mate. Absolutely. Every, every person. And that's how we've gotten to this point. Yeah. Is, you know. Undercutting each other. Yeah. Um, Initially, we all, you know, it was working together. Everyone was having a fair wage and then. Then people start getting competitive, and mm. you know it's just leads to disaster. That's very true. That's very true. So, mate, I think I know one of the the, the next thing that we want to chat about is the environment, mm-hmm. which I know is something you're very, very passionate about. Yep. Uh, and it's something I'm very passionate about as well. You know, I grew up riding through the bush, and you know, it's it's something that uh, is unique to uh, our environment in Australia is very unique, and it needs to be looked after a little bit better, and needs to be managed better. Absolutely. So, you know, one thing, I always thought our national parks growing up, you know, I've, I've always loved them, mm. loved the bush. Absolutely. Um, and I thought they were pretty special. But then once I started going overseas, I was, you know, I realised how mismanaged they actually can be. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I'm really starting to push the idea of a, um, I'd, I'd like to see less crown lands as such where land is actually locked up um, and and left to be. Yes. Um, which in turn creates fuel for fires, and that's why we've been having such devastating fires. Absolutely. I'd like to see more opened up. Mm. Um, and I'm not talking about just opening up and letting loggers come through. No. I'm not saying that at all. No, opening up for the people. Opening up for people to be actually used. And base well, this I mean, off. That's the thing. Like, I know there's a. You, you, how much does it cost to put a fence around some of these national parks? And well, they're what huge. Are, what are you doing that for? You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, as you say, wildfires and stuff like that are a massive issue in Australia. And I, I spent a long time up in the Northern Territory. And you know, you know, I was there for nearly uh, eight or nine years, I think, in the end. Every year, the uh, Indigenous people up there, mm. they backburn. Yep. And the NT government lets them backburn because guess what? They've been doing that for tens of thousands of years. And you never hear of massive wildfires in the Northern Territory, do you? No, that's exactly right. Because it's part of the... Uh, the ecology of the, the system. The ecology of the system That's needs exactly to be right. burnt off. Whereas, you know, like, as you say, they locked the forest, they locked the national parks up in Victoria, and then yep. we had Black Wednesday and Black Saturday. You know, and like, that's a, you know what, 150 odd people died? Something like that. Yeah. And it's just because it's not managed correctly. Yeah. You know, this, this green ideology where it's like, oh, hug a tree, you know, it's it, it doesn't work. Oh, look, it, hug it trees, makes, man. However, look after the tree. You got to look after the tree. Yeah, you can't just leave the tree. You burn. can't just let it keep dropping its leaves year after year and mm. then having a, a build up of a meter plus of of fuel underneath it. Yeah, that that, that was a, that was some of the numbers that came out of that Black Saturday or something. That mm. wasn't it? They measured the foliage was up to one and a half, two meters deep in yep, some areas. In some areas, and yeah. you know, th- there's no natural grass growing underneath that. No, it's choking the the system out. So it isn't actually good for the environment to, no. to have that much. It's not natural. No. Um. And, and one of the funny things is, if you go back through the diaries of the early explorers, we have more trees now on our land than what has ever been in the past because you know, First Nations people used to burn and that would clear out all, this, you know, all, a lot all of the, the suckers trees. coming yeah, through. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it used to be a lot more open. Mm. Um, so people are saying, oh, we don't have enough trees, we need more trees. It, you know, Australia wasn't all one big bushland. No. Most of it was like grassland. Mm. Which was what encouraged the pastoralists so much. It was like, hey. All these look, prairies, pretty much, yeah. Look at this grass to feed our sheep and cattle. Mm. Bang. Mm. 
And then they planted the trees and well, and, then they, and they just let them go. They didn't do anything. And then they start, you know, trying to manage it like they did in Europe and that doesn't work because Australia is so unique. And it's a diverse environment. It is. It's such a diverse environment and, and people don't understand that. You know, you can, you know, there's places in South Australia in WA where you can drive literally from the rainforest to the desert yep. in five hours. Yep. That, that's no joke. Exactly. You know, and, yep. and, and through that you pass scrub, you pass bushland. Mm. You can go through every single eco- ecological profile yep. in a five-hour drive. Well, even on the um, three and a half thousand acre property I'm on, there's three different types of environment on there. So you go from your, your scrub country, your rainforest style country, yep. through to your dry eucalypt forest, yep. down through to your, your alluvial flats. Yeah. So there's three different you, in you, the space got, of three kilometres. You've got three, yeah, in the space of three square kilometres, you've yep. got three different ecologies. Yeah. And each one of those requires its own... Different methods of management. Absolutely. Yeah. So for you can't just blanket manage the whole country. Each area has to be looked at specifically. Yeah. Um, and it's not just about fires as well. You know, the amount of feral animals that are growing, that are booming in national parks. We are losing so many of our native um, critters. Mm. And it's not, it's not all to farming. You can't blame farming. No. You've got to blame the feral animals as well. Like feral cats... Uh, I, th- um, I think it's about 21 um, million um, animals per night are getting killed by feral cats alone. 21 million. So that's little insects, um, amphibians, reptiles. Birds, all that sort of stuff. Marsupials. Yeah, those little cool marsupials. You know, got here. Those, those cats out there, they're, they're big enough to take down a wallaby. Aren't they? They're roaming in packs as well out west, aren't they, these cats? You, you can be trying to light up a tree out in places out west and there would be nothing to see three or four different sets of eyes. Yeah, right. You know, they're not actually working together as such, but they're living so close they're, together, they're, they're just a, yeah. decimating the, you know, the and native well, populations. I know, I know well, there's, there's wild dog packs that are doing that too. They're taking in cattle and all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Yeah, wild dogs are another problem. Yeah. So we, we, we deal with them as well on our place. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, it's not feasible and it's not sustainable to just let nature look after itself. No, and because we interfere, we interfere, we interfere, um, we upset the balance too much to be able to let it look after itself. Yeah, well, we're the ones that brought pigs in. We're the one that's brought, you know, uh, cane toads, Deer, rabbits, yeah. all this stuff, all these things that are actually affecting yep. the natural environment in Australia that weren't here to begin with. Exactly. It's therefore, isn't it, should be our responsibility to look after it. Yep. And we should be rotational burning, um, yeah. you know, and not when it's hot, burn when it's cold, like Absolutely. when it's cooler. Yeah, yeah. well, that's they burn in the dry season up north. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, they, I was reading the other day, they've started burning in places because the humidity is high enough that it'll burn cool. Yeah, it right. Won't, it won't get away. Yeah, um, right. Because yeah, there's a whole heap of temperature and variations you've got to take into account when you're doing that. Yeah, well, they, they were doing that because they knew the rain was coming. So if they got to burn now, they'll actually get some grass growing. Yes. So, you know, that's management. Mm. We've got to listen to our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Yes, absolutely. When it comes to that. Totally, man. You know, we've got to look after them all. Yeah. Um, we can't take them for granted. We can't keep kicking them in the guts. No, and they have knowledge of this land. Absolutely. It's passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. So it's, it's an absolute cry and shame. Oh, it is. I've got, I can totally agree with you. And obviously these animals as well, that are, they need to be managed as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and that, that's, that's a sensitive issue because... You know, we've Disney-fied our animals with Bambi and bloody Peter Rabbit and all that yep. sort of stuff. However, you know, as I remember when the, there was the rabbit plagues and stuff in Victoria when I was a kid, it was yep. unbelievable, like the amount of burrows and just just fields of rabbits, man. Yep. Like you couldn't, it's something, unless you've seen like a mouse plague or a mm. rabbit, or you don't even understand. You can't fathom it. You can't fathom it. And, yep. they, they, you know, things like that need to be controlled and mm. they need to be understood. And obviously that means engaging hunters. Mm. Exactly. That that's part of the solution. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that you know, completely open up and just let people go and guns are blazing. That's not the answer at all. No, definitely not. But controlled, regulated hunting well, underst- is definitely a tool and understanding the population. Conservation. Yeah. Understanding the population, understanding what how much uh, the bush or the forest or that mm. ecology can take. Yep. And keeping that population to a manageable level. Because we have a lack of predators in this country. Exactly. And that's the problem. Yep. You know what I mean? We don't of natural have, predators. Natural predators, yep. exactly. We don't have a mountain We don't lion. have the thylacine anymore. No, that's right. Yeah, you know, the quolls are endangered. Yeah. 
they're getting taken over by foxes, cats, and dogs. Absolutely. Yeah. And look, we've had a, a couple of those little marsupial, little like mouse things with funny ears around mm-hmm. here. Yep. You know, we had a couple living in the roof, and yep. I, I I left them alone. So yeah. Once I realised they weren't mice, I was like, no, nah, you leave those. That, Absolutely. That alone. They're supposed to be there. Yeah. It shows a healthy ecosystem when they're there. Yeah. 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 And and that's the problem. Um, you know, so that's why I'm really pushing towards you know scrapping the the crown land model and, and basing um, you know basing something off the North American public lands model. Yeah. Where you know people can go out and enjoy the back country, um, it's we, we should we should be utilising it. It's a resource. People travel all over the country. We've, mm. we've, people travel up and down the east coast. Let's give them a few extra places to go. Absolutely. Give those small little towns on the way there tourism dollars. Absolutely, because they, they, these towns are on the back of the national parks. They got you know there's. And the Aussie outback and the Aussie bush, mate, there's so many places. If you just do a little bit of exploring, there's so many jaw-dropping places that you could take tourists to that they, 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 people don't understand, yep. you know what I mean? Unless yep. you've explored the Aussie bush or been out there, you don't know. No, that's exactly right. And, that, and you know, that's one thing I love about the Northern Territory is they employ so many Indigenous rangers. Yes. Whereas down here, they're more greeny rangers. Yeah. You know, they've come through yeah, the they're universities. Keeping they're where just they're, keeping you out. They're they're, not, they're that's not exactly actually, right. They're not, they're not managing the land. No. Like, you know, we implement baiting as part of our control of wild dogs on the property. Yeah. So we'll we'll get 60 baits for our 3,500 acres. Mm. Um, the National Park up the road, which is, uh, I think it's nearly 20,000 acres, mm. they get six. Six? Six. If you're going to have a pack of wild dogs, that's where they're going to be. Exactly. That's why we keep getting new dogs every year, because they're coming out of the National Park. Of course they are. So, and then, you know, we've got deer coming as well from the uh, Main Range National Park to our yeah. west. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm talking to farmers who, you know, they reckon within 10 years they're going to be all the way across the scenic rim. I mean, I'm already seeing them in, in a lot more parts and, than what I've ever seen before growing up. Yeah, right. Um, they're, they're, they're sneaking red, up the red rivers. Tail, aren't they? Red deer. Red deer, yeah. Um, there's, there's a um, there's red deer. I haven't seen any fallow yet. Uh-huh. Um, and there's um, rooster as well. Yeah, again, though, a... Uh a, a, a prey animal mm. with no predator yep. is just going to proliferate. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I've spoken to a farmer in the last two weeks. He's like, oh, I keep getting this fence. that keeps getting destroyed. I can't, I've got no cattle in there. I can't understand it. I said, well, he's probably got a deer there, mate. And he, he went and had a look and, yeah, sure enough, there's these deer tracks. Deer tracks, yeah. So, I mean, they're popping up where you just least expect it. Mm. And no, no, nothing's being done at the moment to manage that? Not yet. And, it, you know, most of the time they're on, on um, along the rivers. Yep. Um, in in pockets, mm-hmm. but it won't take long before they breed up enough, and they'll be pushing into other areas. Well, no, if there's nothing nothing holding them back, then they will, you know. Yeah. And and with any ecosystem, too much of one thing is not a good thing, mm. and it upsets the balance. Yep, you know. And then we've got the problem with you know with the hunters, <clears throat> all all our pest species are g- declared as pest animals. Yeah. So <clears throat> any means to kill them, they're getting d- destroyed. Um. So, you know, the hunters get excited and say, oh, we're part of the conservation. Hmm. But then we don't want the government to say, hang on, well, let's go and bait or kill all these deer. Hmm. It's like, no, 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 we, we don't want you to do that. It's like, well, it's a pest animal. Shouldn't you want us to do that? And it's like, no, no, let us do that. So I think we've got to step up and say, utilize us as a conservation tool. Yes. Um, you know, you, the likes of your deer, they're here now. Hmm. We're not going to be able to get rid of them all. No. They're a beautiful animal. Yeah. And you know what? They taste amazing. Yeah, they're pretty tasty. So let yeah. let's upgrade them from a pest, um, from a pest animal to a game animal. Yeah. Implement a tag system. Yeah. Um, that's going to um, create dollars. Yeah. So what we could do is, like in North America, what they've done is they've got the Pittman Robinson scheme. Mm-hmm. So for your taxes, they they got um, I think it's about similar to what our GST would be here on firearms, mm-hmm. on ammunition on bows and arrows, on backpacks, on hiking boots. Yeah, it's like 10% or something like that. Yeah, goes on anything that would be outdoor related, on your fishing gear. Yeah. You know, on every item, 10% of that goes back into the Pittman-Robinson Fund, mm. which funds their wildlife conservation programs. It funds their game wardens who control them. You know, they're the park rangers, basically. Yeah, yep. And that's why they've got such a strong ecosystem from where on the start of the... 20th century, mm. they're on the verge of having no large-bodied wildlife yeah. on their on their country on their continent because they'd been shot out to market hunting. 
Yeah, right. But once they had the Pittman Robertson system underneath it, they're, they're managing, they're managing the population. It. So each year, you know, there's there's a tag system. So the animals will be, you know, if there's a lot of animals, they'll let more tags. If there's less animals, there's less tags. Mm. And then, you know, each area is under control of a, of the game wardens, local um, game council. Mm. I mean, we've got a great system down in New South Wales and um, in Victoria as well, where we have the game um, game licensing unit. Mm. So you can sit a, sit a test and get your game license. And um, they've opened up state forests for these re- um, licensed and regulated hunters yeah. to be able to actually go into state forests and take care of these pests. Mm. At the same time, it's driving tourism into the areas around the state forests. Yeah. It's saving the government an absolute bucket load from having to hire helicopters and sharpshooters to come in. And yeah. you know that's not the most humane way. No, it's not. And unfortunately, the mainstream—that's the sort of stuff that they see. Yeah. Whereas a lot of, a lot of hunters, uh, would happily pay an extra ten percent to not take out of the, a current pot in order to, you know, a lot, even outdoors people. I mean, yep. I'd be happy any outdoor equipment, anything I bought, you know, the stuff that I buy, I'd be happy to pay that. Yeah. That's what it was. That's what it was for. I mean, but that's basically what your fishing license in New South Wales for. It's it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. You know, we've got the stock impoundment permit scheme up here mm. for our freshwater lakes. Yeah. Um, you know, it goes back into that system. Yeah. We just need to apply We need to apply that to the land. Sale. Yeah. You know, it all works in together. And you'd be surprised at how much money we'll raise in no time at all. It'll be self-sustaining. Absolutely. It'll be user pays. Yeah. So it's a win-win. Yeah. Well, it's the same up in Arnhem Land, mate. You've got to pay to go into Arnhem Land. Yep. You've got to pay, you know, you've got to pay for a permit every mm-hmm. three months, whatever yep. it is. Yep. And you happily pay to mm. go and see some of the beautiful spots in Arnhem Land. Yeah, you know what I mean. You go yep. there, you know, it's it's and it's well worth it. Mm. You know? And it's the yep. same thing that that employs the indigenous rangers and all those sorts of things that exactly. take care of the land. Exactly. And it, it it makes very a lot of sense, you know. And I think it's as you say, a bit of a greeny centric, you know, hug the trees thing. However, people need to understand it from a different point of view, where this is actually looking after the land. Mm. You know, That's what it's about, and it's, and it's about utilising the land. Absolutely, land. yeah. What's the point of having all this land locked up that no one can go and enjoy? And why we and, and and what's the arrogance that we can lock up land? Yeah, I mean, in a in an age where we're battling obesity, but we're locking up land for people to go out and exercise. Yeah, go and have a look around. Yeah, yeah. Go get some fresh air in your lungs. Yeah, go and see the waterholes. Yeah. Go and do that. You know what I mean? You know, go go chuck a a um, lure in a in a stream. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in most of these national parks, no one's putting fish into the streams because, well, they can't go and fish them, um, you know, as easily as what they can anywhere else. So why would they restock the systems? Yeah, and why would you, why would you pay any attention to it? You can't get in. Exactly. And as you say, these rangers that are controlling the Crown land, they're not, they're keeping people out. They're yep. not doing anything. They're not doing their job properly. No. Uh, they're, they're doing their job to what's demanded at the moment. Yeah, they're, they're doing the job that they're subscribed, they're prescribed to do. That's exactly right. Yeah. We need to ex- expand that and utilise it. It's mm. it's a resource. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there'd be enough people out there that I think would get on board with that. I think that's a really, really good idea. I, re- I really believe so. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's going to take time because I don't think, you know, and there's going to be a lot of stakeholders that we'd have to discuss it with, mm. um, you know, looking into a lot of different angles to, you know, t- just to cover all the angles, make sure it is going to be beneficial Absolutely. to the people. Absolutely. Um, you know, rock climbers, hikers. Mountain bikers. Mountain, mountain bikers, you know. You know yeah. it's, it's not just about hunters and fishers. It's, no, absolutely, mate. You, you open know, those lands riders, up, I'll be, in, I'll be in there on my mountain bike, mate. Yep. Don't you worry about that. Exactly. So, I mean, it's... I, I can't understand why no one else is looking towards it. There probably are, but they're not being loud enough on it. I'm certainly going to be loud on it if I um, get elected. Absolutely, and I think it's a, a worthy issue. As a, and, you know, it, something that uh, is close to my heart as well, mate. I remember being a kid, and when they put the big highway through where I played in the bush, you know, it's like, what's what's going on here? The destruction, and you know, I, I couldn't understand it as a small kid, you know. Yeah, and yeah. It's, um, yeah, very important. You know, when we've got... Um, vegetation laws where a farmer can't clear a, a tree break you know on a state on his boundary to a state forest or a national park yet a developing come in and knock down prime koala habitat here in the southeast corner yeah you know that's a bit hypocritical absolutely absolutely we're going to finish on a 
a bit more of a sensitive topic, but it's it's a tool of your trade that you use every day. Uh, guns, mate. Mm-hmm. So what what are your thoughts there, bud? What, what I, I'm not very experienced. I know we went out and had a bit of a shoot at your property, mm-hmm. and I really enjoyed that. However, yep. what's your viewpoint, mate? How we how we, how are we getting the viewpoint from you across there? Shooting as a sport is very safe. Absolutely, yeah, I totally agree. It's very enjoyable, and it brings a self a sense of um, self responsibility and self respect. Yeah. So when it's applied carefully, it's it's a great sport to undertake. Mm. Um, unfortunately, law abiding since Port Arthur, law law abiding fire firearm owners have been branded as if we're all potential psychopaths. Yes. Instead of dealing with a mental health issue, yes, they're just going, hang on, let's just blame an inanimate object. Mm. This is an object that, you know, when you think about it, it can't fire itself. No. So why would you blame an inanimate object instead of the person that's behind it? So we've got to move towards um, more understanding around shooters. Yes. Um, I, 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 do, I do agree with that, yeah. And I don't think... I think shooters are very scared to put themselves forward for fear of backlash. Oh, and there's a stereotype there. There certainly is. Yeah. And, you know, since since I got my firearm license, um, I've introduced, I think, four people mm. who had never shot before mm-hmm. to the sport. Yeah. And they've then gone and got their licenses and go to the ranges, you know, bought their own firearms, bought their own safes, Follow the follow the laws. Responsible gun owners. Responsible gun owners. Yeah, and that's you know we've got to focus on them. We can't you, you know on the roads you don't uh, brandish uh, tar every driver as if they're a hoon. No, definitely not. So why would we? Why would the media or the government be happy to tar all the shooters as psychopaths? Yeah. It's just not right. No, you know New Zealand. It was absolute. I was appalled by it. It was disgraceful. Absolutely. And, you know, my, my heart goes out, I, you know, innocent people like that. It's undeserved. Un- unarmed. Yeah. They're unarmed. At the end of the day, um, whether anyone perceives any guilt or not, um, that's up to an individual to decide. That's not for me to decide. No. But they were unarmed human beings. Yeah. That were treated less than like they were animals. Mm. And that was disgraceful. And that is not the act of a sporting, of a shooter, no. sporting shooter, law abiding firearm owner. No, that's a, because that's a that's a that's that's a it's a gentleman with uh, some issues, and there's that is not the way forward at all. Well, he's a political terrorist to Absolutely. start with. Yeah, totally. you know, to the way he's released his manifesto and filmed it, it wasn't a it wasn't about a, a Muslim thing. No, it was a political thing. Yeah, he said that in his statement that it was about creating as much diversion as possible, division as possible. Yeah, and getting rid of gun laws. That's why he could have used any other tool. He had thought about using any other tool. Mm. Could have used a bomb. Yeah. Could have used a truck. Um, he chose guns because they're so divisive. And, you know, Jacinta Ardern has said, you know, I won't say his name. I won't give him anything. Well, you are giving him something. You're giving him... You're taking away the, the guns from people who aren't, aren't doing anything wrong. Mm. Um, the moment that he put a 30-round magazine into that rifle... He broke the law. Yeah. The moment he purchased the 30-round magazine without a license for it, for that category of weapon, he broke the law. Yeah. So he was not a law-abiding firearm owner. No. He found those weapons on the black market somewhere. Well, he, he could get the weapons. It's, the weapons aren't the problem, okay? The, in New Zealand, they could have up to a... On a Category A license, you can have a semi-automatic weapon with up to seven rounds magazine capacity. Right. Which, you know, it it's not very much. No. Over in the blink of an eye. Yeah. Um, but he's gone out and bought, I think it's a Category E um, magazine, which is a 30 round. Mm-hmm. So he had the straight uh, magazines, then he had drum magazines as well. They He wasn't licensed for them. So straight away he's a criminal. Mm. And then killing people, that's that's a criminal act. Uh, none of the so, highest. you know, m- murder's been illegal for forever yeah but people still do it yeah banning murder is not going to stop murder no banning guns and taking guns off law abiding firearm motors isn't going to stop people getting shot criminals will find a way to get ahead i've seen pictures of you know stapler guns uh, like handheld stapler guns you get from bunnings 
welded to a bit of pipe and modified into a gun. They're going to find a way to do something illegal if they're that way inclined. Yeah. So the problem's with the person. It's not with the inanimate object. Right. So Australia's, you know, we've got the um, National Firearms Agreement. It's it's absolutely disgraceful. It was, it was, it was rushed through. Um, it was led by the, the greenies on the left who, uh, you know, Gun Control Australia, dancing in the blood of, of victims. It, you know, it's absolutely disgraceful. It doesn't make sense. Um, so we've got, to, we've got to scrap the National Farms Agreement. We've got farmers, you know, living hundreds of kilometres from towns who need a Category H, um, which is a handgun here, um, to, you know, as part of the daily tools. Yeah. I mean, I carry a rifle because that's what I'm allowed to do. Yeah. But out there, it's not easy to carry a rifle in some of those places, so they'll carry a handgun mm. strapped to their hip. No yeah. problem. Um, you know, it doesn't fire unless they actually pull the trigger. No, that's true. Um, so what the current law is for handgun owners is they've got to go and um, do competition shoots yes. or at, a gun, at a gun club, do six, I think it's six a year in per order, category their of their, yeah, that's right. So it's just not, that's not sustainable for farmers that, that have got to go. And it's not practical. It's not practical. So, I mean, you're not, you're not saying, you know, go and buy a minigun. You're saying just be more practical about the laws around people and their tasks and the jobs that they have and actually be more honest about what is going on. Absolutely. So you look at a builder, right? If he's got to hang a, a nail on the wall, yeah. hammer a nail on the wall to hang a picture, he'll grab a hammer. Yeah. But if he's got to build the wall, he's, he's going to grab a nail gun. Exactly. So why can't our farmers be exactly the same? If they need to do one, one little thing, they've got a tool for that. Yeah. But if they need to do another thing, they which to, which they do as part of their job, yeah. they need to have access to the tools to do it. Absolutely. And I don't disagree with that at all, mate. I don't disagree with that at all. And I think, and look, an open discussion about that is is very good. And as you say, New Zealand was a, a heinous crime by a political terrorist that is not disgusting. And unfortunately, when these things happen, reactions happen as well. However, there needs to be some sanity around... Emotional response... Emotional response on a leadership level is, I don't. I think you've got to take emotion out of it and yeah. think logically. You've yeah. got to take a step back. Yes, it's upsetting. I was upset. Everyone was, man. Yeah, everyone. Any sane person yeah. was upset by what happened. And the fact that it was an Aussie that it shocked me. I must admit, it, it, it did. Well, it for me it didn't matter who he was. It was the fact that a human could be so callous just to do that in cold blood. Yeah, you know that. That's the sort of stuff you'd expect someone from ISIS to do. Yes. You know, that's, they are not sane people. No. But he was so calculated in how he did it, mm. it was absolutely disgraceful. Um, you know, I'm, I'm appalled and I've, I take offence to anyone that suggests his actions represent my actions as a law-abiding firearm owner. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, totally. You know, I think I saw something the other day is that it, that it should be uh, an act looked at by all white Australians. That's disgusting and terrible. Like, yep. there's no, there's not a person that I know that isn't disgusted by what happened. Exactly. And, you know, and everyone just needs to be cool. Just chill out. Just be cool. And just, just let's all get along. Yeah. Well, look, I think, look, a, a, a discussion about that and using the tools for what they are, not being ridiculous about it, not, you know, it's an open, sane discussion. You know, about firearms, about the environment, about farmers, you know, getting uh, proper infrastructure for your electorate. Yeah. I, I, mate, obviously, I don't have a dog in the fight. You're, you're, I'm, you're not part of my electorate. However, mate, I, I think, um, yeah, good luck, man. And obviously, we're good mates. However, total respect for what you're doing, mate. And I, I can't uh, say enough what a pleasure it is to have you on the podcast and, and, to, and to have you express yourself. And uh, to let me know your ideas, mate. It, t to finish up, have you got anything else you want to say to your to your people and and to the, to the loyal listeners? Well, I'll say, I'll say it to all listeners. Um, one of my messages is know who your candidate is mm -hmm. in this coming elections for any any election in the future. Yeah. Don't just vote how your grandparents have always voted or your parents have voted. Actually, make a decision. Make a decision. Make an informed decision. Do some research. To make an informed. Find out decision. who your candidates are. What mm -hmm. they stand for. Yeah. Because you can't just leave, rely on what the party stands for. You got to find out what the candidates stand Absolutely. for. Absolutely, take responsibility for the you know for your area, mm. and um, 
you know, and get involved. Yeah. Politics, once, you know, up until very recently, politics has been one of those things like religion, like money. You don't talk about it to anyone. No, no. It's You keep it to yourself. Yeah. We've got to talk about politics because it affects everyone. Absolutely. We've got to have a civil conversation. Yeah. I've, you know, I've got no problem with any person who comes up to me and says, I don't agree with you. I agree with what the Greens say. Fine. That's fine. As long as you understand what you're getting in your vote. Yeah. What, do you what, understand what they're saying? Do you understand what their points are, their policies are? Do you understand what my policies are? Yeah. Yep. Compare it all and understand you know, what's best for you and what's best for your community. And whatever is best for you is best for you. Mm. You know, you, you want the people to make an informed decision yep. what is best for their electorate. Absolutely. And that's fair enough, mate. That's fair enough. And, I, and I, you know, we've, at Cutters Australia Party, we've got a great team coming towards um, this federal election. Um, you know, we're cover, covering six electorates across Queensland, which between those six is about 80% of Queensland. I can't believe the size of the electorates. I had no idea that that's, that's, that's how they split it up. That's yeah, crazy. It was, that's crazy. It's huge. And... Um, you know, great team, real people. You know, no one's a career politician. Everyone's got a, a trade, a day job. Yeah. And um, we've got teachers. We've got um, uh, mechanics. We've got another farmer. Um, actual big, Aussie people. That's actual it. Aussie people. Yeah. We've got we've got a fisherman. Yeah. You know, real people. And um, you know, what you see is what you get with us. Yeah. Have a look at our website www.kap.org.au. Yeah. Look it up. Look up our policies. Yeah, look, if, 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 if there's a, a, a can in your electorate, make sure you give them just due diligence, I think, mate, is, is, is all Absolutely. you're asking. Absolutely. That, that's awareness. all I can ask. Just awareness. Just yep. understand who we are, what we stand for. Mm. Go look at the other candidates as well. Find out who we Well, you have to, mate. I think that's... It's, it's about it, education. It's about education. If you, if you want to be responsible and part of your electorate, you need to give everyone uh, their due diligence so you can make an informed decision uh, to, to see what's best for you. I think that's the reality. Absolutely. That's the only way this country is going to go forward. And, you know, I, I have you know such high hopes and expectations for this country. We're, you know, we're a wonderful nation of people. Mm. We um, are, absolutely. I, I think we just need to stop believing everything that the mainstream media says. Start thinking for yourself. Look, at, look into a backstory. Yep. Do a bit of education. Absolutely. Research. I think Australia's going to be pretty good for it. And look in, and and look after your community. Be a part of your community. I think as well is very important. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not you know, it's, don't <laughs> it, as uh, JFK said. It's not what you can do for your, uh, what your country can do for you. It's what you can, you can do, do for your country. country. Yeah. yeah, that's that's great. Go out and join a community group. Yeah, little things make big things grow. Absolutely. Awesome, man. Well, thanks, Riff. Thanks very much, mate. I, I can't, uh, as I say, thank you very much for coming on, and. As I say, you're not in my lecture, but I'm behind you, mate, and best of luck. And, and uh, you know, come on again and, and we'll discuss it again as, as, as it progresses and we'll see where we go. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Awesome, mate. Thanks very much. Cheers. Television, what you said is what you got.